Okay, so I quickly went through the definitions or few definitions of the complex number. Now we're gonna dive straight into seeing a complex number in a plane. Now this part is gonna be in, a bit interesting, just like how a plane of X and Y you can represent a real number. This time we're gonna use a plane to represent a complex number. Now, complex number, as you know, has two components, the real component and the imaginary component. So, if we were to draw the axis, which goes like this, and up here like this, and draw big enough, okay, this we would like to call the real component, which is denoted as RE, and this would be called the imaginary component over here. So, just applying simple XY plane theory, if you may call it, but now using the real and imaginary theory, if you've got a complex number Z equals to 3 plus 2i, the real component is 3, so we'll mark a 3 over here, and the imaginary component is 2, so we mark a 2 over here, and then that is the complex number that we have, Z. Okay, now, moving, now, taking this as the standard form. This is what we like to call the standard form of a complex number. There's another way that we can write the complex number and that is in a polar form or what we like to call the polar, polar coordinates of a complex number. If you study polar coordinates, you should be familiar with this procedure but if you haven't, you gotta just take my word for it. Okay, what we do is that we draw a ray from here to Z and in polar form, to represent complex number Z, we got R which is, what we call, which is what we define just now as the modulus or the magnitude of complex number Z and we got a, th a theta over here which is called the argument of Z let me just write it down okay. this is the argument of Z and R is the magnitude of Z Okay, so now we just uh, draw a line here. Okay, and then now here we know that here is A, the distance between here and here is A, just like the real, the real component and the distance here and here is B. So, applying simple trigonometry, we have R times sine theta is equal to B, and R times cosine theta is equal to A. And previously, we got Z equals to A plus B, I, substituting the values inside because Z is equal to R times cosine theta plus R times sine theta I as its imaginary component and now we write this equal to as R cosine theta plus sine theta I or more conventionally we can write I sine theta and there we go, that is how we represent a complex number Z in terms of polar coordinates. Bear in mind that R is the magnitude of Z, which is represented by the distance here, and theta is what we call the argument of Z. To define formally, and I'm going to take a stab at this, okay, is the angle the ray from the complex number to the origin mixed with the real axis. Okay, I thought I did that well enough. You can go read the definitions on the page to see that clearly. That's what we define the argument as. So, let's just take it a step further. Okay, the conjugate of Z, okay, is actually... Now, if we notice that this is the B, remember we define the conjugate as A take away BI. So basically, we'll just bring this dot over here because this is B minus BI is somewhere over here. Okay? Now, simple geometry, you can see that theta now becomes negative. Okay, this angle here is minus theta. Okay, it becomes negative. So, the conjugate of Z is equals to R cosine minus theta, bearing in mind that the magnitude is still the same, plus I sine minus theta. Okay, but we know that for cosine, it absorbs the, the this minus sign over here, so this is equals to R cosine theta, and for a sine function, we can bring the minus out inside to get I sine, minus I sine theta. And there is go, that is what we have as the conjugate, and following suit, we got 1 over the complex number Z, as defined previously as conjugate of Z over 
magnitude of z squared. So this is simply equal to that, right? The conjugate of z is equal to this, r cosine theta minus i sine theta, close bracket, over r squared. Because the magnitude of z is r, as we have shown just now, the magnitude of z equals r and you square that. So if we minus this one out, we got r over here, there. That is what we have as the 1 over z, 1 over complex number z. Taking a step further, just want to confirm the magnitude of z as square root a squared plus b squared, as we shown you just now. Now that we have a geometric representation on the graph of the real axis and the imaginary axis, it's clear to see that a squared, since this is the right angle here, a squared plus b squared, is equal to r squared, which is the magnitude of z squared. So to get the magnitude of z, we just square root a squared, um, a squared plus b squared via what everybody know as Pythagoras theorem. So we'll just leave this s here and move on to a famous guy called Leonard Euler. Euler. Uh, Euler. Okay, uh, he was a great mathematician. I would like to ex um, talk more about him later, but. Um, I'll save that for another chapter. Okay, he had a really good formula, a really famous formula that connects the transcendental number E, which is approximately 2.71. And this amazing formula that he wrote is E, imaginary I, is equals to cosine theta plus I sine theta. A very powerful formula, and I would also say it's very beautiful because it connects a trigonometry function with an imaginary number with the E number here. And if you were to notice, E is actually just a real number, though that you know it's a um, irrational real number, but it's still very powerful because we can connect everything like this. Uh, one day when I work hard enough, which is gonna be very soon, I'll post a, try to post a proof on it to see whether you know, we can show that. Okay, so this would also mean that magnitude of EI, let's just say, okay, is equals to the square root of cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta as we have using this formula over here okay and this is equals to one square root is equals to one so that would mean that we can write the polar form over here z equals to r times cosine theta plus i sine theta this thing okay is equal to this thing over here so another way to represent a complex number z is equal to the magnitude r which is over here times the Euler number e i to the power of i theta there another way you can write a complex number quite a neat way i must add and after that there's also one step we can take further in looking at e x plus i y Okay, why we want to look at that? Well, let's just see what we can come up with because by indices, law of indices, this would be equal to E i times E i y. Okay, and then using the Eulian formula, this would equal to E x. Then we put this out, which would be cosine y plus i sine y. So, what does this mean? Well, this means that a complex number like this, the magnitude of it is now depending only on e to the power of x, just like how the magnitude of a complex number z is depending on r. Okay, I hope you can see that. This part over here really determines the argument, which determines where the complex number is. But this part over here determines the magnitude, like that. So if we were to look over here, just think about it in the same way. Magnitude determined by r, and where the complex number is, is determined by e to the power of uh, i theta. So if we got a complex number like this, likewise, magnitude is depending on this over here, okay, e to the power of x, and the argument or the position is determined by this over here, cosine y plus i sine y, just like that over here. So, you know, that is quite interesting by Leonard Euler, who I must say did a lot of great work. Okay, now, okay, I will just 
uh, erase this and move on very quickly to sum up this section on the addition and multipl multiplication of a complex number. Okay, now some.